Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I'm here today with a colleague and brilliant bestselling author, Stephen Kotler. We're going to talk about his many bestselling books and his latest work, NAR County Today, and I'll introduce him formally in just a moment. Um, if you haven't caught my previous episodes, you can catch them all on YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And I hope you'll stop by and rate and review. Today is especially exciting for me because as I've written my book this last several years, one of um, my heroes and inspirational um, authors that I've read uh, is Stephen Kotler, and he's here with me today. Let me formally introduce him and then we'll dive right in. Stephen Kotler is a New York Times bestselling author, an award-winning journalist, and the executive director of the Flow Research Collective. He's one of the world's leading experts on human performance. Stephen is the author of 10 bestsellers, including The Art of Impossible, The Future is Faster Than You Think, Stealing Fire, The Rise of Superman, Bold and Abundance. His work has been nominated for two Pulitzer Prizes, translated into over 50 languages, and he's appeared in over 100 publications, including New York Times Magazine, Wired, Atlantic Mon Monthly, Wall Street Journal, Time, and the Harvard Business Review. Alongside his wife, author Joy Nicholson, he is also the co-founder of the Buddy Sue Hospice Home for Old Dogs, a canine elder care facility, and Rancho, Rancho de Chihuahua, a dog rescue sanctuary. Uh, Stephen Kotler, thank you so much for your time and for joining me today. For sure. It's good to be with you. Thank you. Um, so I know you don't know me that well. I know a lot about you. What I'd love to start with is story always drives what we do, the curiosity that we bring to life and the work that we do. You've done a lot of transformational work, not only in my life and framing how flow can help health and aging, and we're going to go into that today, but also just how flow states in general can really optimize human performance. What I'd love to know, though, is what's your story? Where did you grow up? How did your childhood, your life, the things that you saw and did as a younger person um, frame what you came to be with passion and purpose in your life with the flow states. Was there any particular um, memories or experiences that you had that you that you realized you were this curious person that had um, such a potential? I don't. I had an amazing mom. Mm -hmm. I had an amazing mom is the place you got to start because when I when when I was born, my folks didn't have a whole lot of money, mm -hmm. and my mom was young. She was early 20s and I don't necessarily know if she really knew, like I was her first kid, but I don't necessarily know if she knew what she was doing, but she knew books were good yes. and libraries were good. And so she used to just go to the library and we'd pick out a hundred books and she'd read them to me until I figured out how to read and then I'd read them to her. And so I, you know, there was just a love of language and learning um, that sort of went together for me that goes all the way back. Um, other than that, I mean, I was an action sport athlete going all the way back. I was an animal geek sort of going all the way back. So sort of the things I'd become in, in my adult life, I think I started out uh, being uh, in early childhood a little bit. That's so fascinating because curiosity, as you well know and have written, is one of the foundations of flow. And I would go further to say, I think it's a foundation of genius. And you clearly had this curiosity as a young child. But isn't it neat when we have those experiences of our parents actually fostering that? and kind of encouraging that because clearly reading is such a powerful thing. I feel like you have uh, been, again, in, in my world, I'm an avid reader. I mean, probably two, 300 books a year. And you are one of my favorite authors. And I think not only have you taken the study of flow to this level, but you're also, you have also really um, made yourself this incredible um, author and writer. How did the writer part of you get developed? How did that come into place? The writer part was there. My so, my grandmother, my mom's mom, was a poet, and I used that in the hallmark greeting cards. That's the word, right? But um, so there was, but there was no barriers to entry. Like my grandmother was doing it. So like I, I was four years old, and I remember being at her kitchen table. I still have this somewhere. Um, and I wrote up my first poem. So I started writing really early on. Um, my my senior project in high school was a collection of poems. My my senior thesis in college as an undergraduate was again in poetry. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm actually trained as a poet, which is wow. totally bizarre. Um, but uh, and only uh, only transitioned into fiction when I moved into grad school. But uh, and then transitioned into journalism when I was trying to figure out how to like make a living while I was writing my first novel, basically. Um, so the writing has always been with me. Um, it took a lot. I was 
what, what, so it took a while how to learn how to like do what I can do in poetry, in fiction, and then in journalism, and then in nonfiction books. Um, I had sort of a backwards learning process. I could do amazing things with words long before I understand the rules of grammar. Um, Cause you don't need grammar if you're a poet <laughs> you're, or not right away yeah. at least. Um, right. Um, I got away with it for a while. I love that because what I've always, I've never been hugely into poetry, but what I realized recently in writing and, and working on film and producing and things is the eloquence is in the, the, the length, the editing is in the conciseness of words, right? Like the brilliance really comes in the editing. And if you can say something brilliant in less words, poetry is the ultimate example, right? Because you say something, you move someone with very, very few words. So it doesn't surprise me that your brilliant writing was founded on this idea that the, um, lack of words or the smallness of words can actually be way more powerful if they're the right words right and so that doesn't surprise the, me it's the <laughs> smallness of this the, the, yeah, the brevity yeah. for sure yeah. also yeah. the uh what you get really good at as a poet and you can't i don't think learn maybe if you're an actor and you're running lines you, you start to figure this out maybe a songwriter perhaps but um words change when you put two words next to each other and you start changing one of those words um you get to watch what happens to meaning to emphasis to rhythm all those things and they're all none of those are visible right those that's all pattern recognition pattern matching it's unconscious learning and it's really hard to teach it's like teaching style i i've done it and you can do it and it's challenging and interesting there are sort of ways around it but it's not easy and the main reason it's not easy is because a lot of the like core stuff that you need it's non-conscious information acquisition it's you know rhythm and beats and things that you you it's really hard to get consciously you just need laps through it and poetry definitely gave me those laps that makes so much sense. It's almost like let me also let me also say for the record, I was a terrible poet. I was a bad poet. <laughs> um, I might be able to become a good poet in you know in, in older and older, but I don't think I had much command over what I was doing. But I was doing really fancy, sort of dazzling things with language. So I don't think most people understood that I didn't have a clue. I got over, but I, I don't necessarily know if I was a great poet. You kind of uh, uh, wowed them, and then, but I, I bet you were pretty good. I wonder. It makes me think. Was that maybe your first experience with flow? Not really understanding what it was, or what? Where? Where would you say before you even were conscious of what? No, that the be, the first clear memory of flow, I was twelve or third, eighth grade, eighth grade, I think. I was at Seven Springs Ski Area, which is in Pennsylvania, about three hours from my home in Cleveland, um, and the girl uh, I had a crush on, Vicky, uh, was rumored to be on the chairlift. And I decided I was going to show off and I threw uh, my very first back scratcher off a, mm -hmm. off a jump. Um, and it turns out she wasn't on the chairlift um, at all. She wasn't even in town. It was just a rumor. But I swear, I, you know, I heard the rumor and I saw her on the chairlift. She wasn't actually there. Uh, but it, uh, it did throw me into my first, um, probably not my first flow state. Um, but my first deep macro flow state, it was the first time I remember time dilating, slowing down, yes. um, getting that freeze from effect. So that really stuck with me. It took a real, I mean, you know, er, it, early days, especially for a while, nobody really, we didn't even have a word called right. flow, right? Like we were, it was quasi mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. Nobody really knew what we were looking at. Uh, Chick sent me high, coined the term, but like synonyms were confusing was maslow's peak experience the same thing as chick sent me high's flow the same thing as bill jackson's in the zone the same thing as jim's fix runner high and right like we had all these synonyms nobody knew what was under the hood what was really going on and it was hard to figure out and and then you'd have these experiences and you were like well i'm one with everything i'm having an out-of-body experience or you know yeah. quasi really powerful mystic experiences that we now 30 years later, understand where they're coming from in the brain and why they're coming. But, you know, back when all this was starting, there was just, a, it was just magic. Yes. Yes. It was, you're magic, right? For it. Yeah. Which is so fun because my realm is taking your research in um, Mixi High, uh, I can never say his name, uh, Mihai. 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 Thank you. I've said it a million times and I still can't say it. But, so but don't I, feel bad. <laughs> I learned to say it because I was on NPR in Cleveland, Ohio, and I slaughtered his name. And 
somebody called in the show and they said, hey, tell the moron, <laughs> chick sent me high. Ooh, that's good. And I went, chick sent me high. Okay, I'm never going to forget it again. And thank you for calling thank me. Thank you for a moron. Right. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> because I've, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've been practicing it still, but that's perfect. Um, so from now and on. He, I mean, you, he, he, he didn't even, I mean, he, you know, asked me to call him Mike the first time I talked to him. Yeah, <laughs> no one can get my name. So, um, so oh, I've got so many directions I want to go. I want to talk about the neurotransmitters because medically, obviously, those are fascinating to me. But before we do, I want to just share an observation, and then I want to know your take because what I feel like is all of your ideas, all of uh, um, all of this flow research can be applied to human health and performance, and which is what you've talked about, and we'll talk about your book and how, your experience with skiing. I can't wait to get there. But before we do. One observation is I grew up bioengineering, very analytical, using the left brain, um, problem solving, pattern recognition. But in my 20 years as a functional medicine, kind of a detective, what I've seen is the power comes from taking that data driven analytical processing, which is where you start collecting experience. And now this right brain intuitive, which is the subconscious processing of that data, I come to solutions much quicker. And now it's the combination of those. And I know I'm saying it the same way you have before, but any thoughts on even the practice of medicine, because I don't know if you realize, but our training and our medical system is so masculine, analytical driven, science-based, which is wonderful. But sometimes we're told that that intuitive sense that we have that knowing where we've seen patterns of this case, in this case, in this case, and we see the patterns, we're like, I think this is the thing that comes from a very intuitive place. And then we prove it with science. So both equally have power, but I see that reflected in your work because I feel like there's um, this blending of the both places where the magic happens, right? The, the um, uh, subconscious, the um, intuitive and the science, and you need both, but any, maybe I'm not clear here, but I'd love to know common so, that works in performance of, of, of like problem solving. So, um, it's funny, uh, um, I'm working on a big, uh, a really big paper on the, on the neural science, the neurobiology and the neural dynamics of intuition yes. right now. And I'm working on a book on intuition, uh, that's off in the future. Um, which is interesting because I, so I am really cautious with stuff, especially um, what gets said out loud, because, you know what I mean? Like wherever it starts, it may start with intuition, usually starts with, I have an experience and it matches something I've read in a science paper from a weird angle. Right. And that's like that. That's the first thing. And it and it is more. But it's, I'm really, you know, I've spent my whole career trying to put flow science on a, on a hard science footing yes. and and being really, really as rigorous as I possibly could be, um, which is not to say that a lot of it, you know, a lot of the how things come together, the pattern matching, the pattern recognition, as you said, that's intuitive. And for sure. in so. As you mentioned at the start of the show, my wife and I uh, run a hospice care and special needs dog sanctuary. And my new book, Nar Country, is on peak performance aging. And my actual first work on peak performance aging was doing hospice care work with the dogs. And my wife is one of the best diagnosticians for canine issues in the world. And I see it, it and you know, in the beginning, First, in the beginning, I thought she was just making shit up, yeah. right? She would see patterns that I didn't see. Okay. So like she was referring to things that I literally hadn't even developed the awareness to be able to see. So I was like, I don't like, I don't know if my wife is lying to me or making things up. Or like, I didn't know what was going right, on for right. years, right? Until I actually started, you know, had enough experience that I could see the same things she was seeing and, and understand things like that. But I've learned, um, especially around animals, um, there, I mean, which is not to say that doctors and, you know, vets, diagnosticians aren't wrong, but I've learned to really, you know, get it. I, I always, if, if something's wrong with that animal, I ask Joy, I want her an intuitive opinion as much as I'm going to start turning to articles. And, you know, I'm going to go back to the science, but there's nothing. Um, it's the same thing with language, right? I see things in language that are completely invisible to most of the world or same thing with being an ex flow science i see things i read flow papers and i see stuff that most 
everybody misses, um, that's expertise, right? And that's, you know, and certainly it exists in medicine and it's interesting. Um, so I, I uh, last night did a podcast with Scott Barry Kaufman and uh, Jordan, I'm blanking her last name. Oh my God, I feel terrible. Um, she's the founder of Positive Medicine, but uh, she's a doctor and um, we were talking about she's trying to revolutionize how doctors are trained um and where that's where positive medicine the idea comes from and she's dealing with all the obvious stuff like the burnout and the you know overworking and the fact that you know doctors have heart attacks more frequently than everybody else and they're high in suicide and all that stuff but it it's interesting because i've i've done a bunch of work with surgeons i've done a bunch of work with doctors i was talking to her about it last night none of the none of the medical school training is about flow and that's what doesn't make sense to me because we know when you, norepinephrine and dopamine, which show up in flow, amplify signal to noise ratios in the brain that you, you see more patterns. Now, are all those patterns going to be right? No. So in like diagnostically in the hands of a young doctor, flow could probably be a disaster, right? There's nobody's really done that work, but mm -hmm. You know, but once there's actual expertise, they're amping the pattern recognition up and you know that the dopamine high is something to be suspicious of, right? Yeah. Like it, it does amplify pattern recognition, but it also makes you feel really good. So you think yes. every pattern is great. It's why right. flow is known to produce um, compulsive shopping, right? Never go shopping in a flow state. You'll buy everything, right? Like everything looks good. And uh, so, well, you know, flow this, and mania could be like this far apart, right? They're like re right, really <laughs> close. And, you know, well, it's it's funny because when I talk about uh, you know, nor every, everybody thinks, oh, just give me more of these neurochemicals, more norepinephrine, more dopamine. And if you turn up the crank on both, you get either mania or schizophrenia, right? Depending on how much you crank it up and what's mixed in there. Um, so yeah, that's there's a you know, like everything, there's a there's a balance that we want to exist in between of in between. I love that because that's, I mean, even the foundation of what I've been doing is like, how do we take great science and not uh, leer too far from that, but also just expand the idea of, of what is possible in healing and what is possible in peak performance and what is possible in finding answers to, you know, seemingly impossible diagnoses or incurable diseases. So I love that because the truth is we have to found it on good science. And even if we have an intuitive suspicion, like you were sharing with your wife or whatever, we still go back and check with the data but it's like, where did that meld? Because the idea is even if you're read a, reading a paper and you get an idea of something that no one's written about, you take that idea, you go look at the rest of the papers and decide, is this worth writing about, pursuing or researching? And then maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But that idea came from that creative. Yeah, I like, I mean, I always say that the order of the process, and I, and I tell this to the, all the folks I work with, um, and it's, it's sort of, a, it's a rule at, at, at my company, which is insight, research, publication, meaning put it out there in a peer reviewed right. way. So smart people will be done your idea <laughs> and then, and only then communication. Brilliant. And right. Like, and if you follow that order, you can't, I don't think get in too much trouble. You'll probably still get stuff wrong, yeah. um, but not as much. Yeah. And in your field, and again, in medicine, just like the, the people you were interviewing, that's how we change is we have to bring good research because we can't have just an idea without any backing. So Love, love, love that foundation. Briefly, let's talk about neurotransmitters. We obviously, dopamine or epinephrine are clearly um, part of the um, blend of flow and there's some more there too. But what place, I feel like, again, even asking about your childhood, you probably genetically were programmed to seek flow, to, to be curious. Like there were things that you were genetically born with but some of this can be trained and acquired and you've clearly laid out a map in like uh, art of impossible of how to reach flow states, even if you're not naturally drawn to that. What portion of this is environmental versus genetics, you know, nature nurture thing, because I see the genetic mutations and I see those people mm. who are high achievers and seeking, like, for example, for me, I have issues with dopamine breakdown. And so I seek motorcycle riding, rock climbing scheme because it, I love flow states, right? So do you, not everybody I know has that natural intrinsic genetic piece. Is there, how much of that like natural seeking flow is there from genetics and how much is our environment and trainable? So um, let's start with, tra let's work back with it. First of all, massively trainable, right? At the Flow Research yes. Collective, yes. as you know, we have an eight week training, right? It's digitally delivered. You go through the PhD, a psychologist, a neuroscientist, a coach, and it's intense, as you know. Um, 
and a lot of work, but we see it when we we're data geeks. So we measure everything, as you know, um, we see on average a 70 to 80% boost in flow on the back end. Um, that this is incredibly, incredibly trainable. And number one, um, it's trainable. And number very two, very trainable. Program, and, which we'll link and, to. And, you, and let's, mm -hmm. let's, I mean, start with the basic idea, first of all, which is peak performance is nothing more or less than just getting our biology to work for us yes. rather than against us, right? That's all we're doing. And I'd love to tell you that our, you know, Kung Fu is the absolute best. And that's why we're seeing a 70, 80% boost in flow. And maybe that's some of it, but a lot of it is, this is our biology. Everybody's hardwired for this. It's built in part portion being human. Everybody can get into flow. So um, teaching people to take advantage of, of what's built in um, is, is really the secret there. So very trainable, but let's get back to your questions because you asked a bunch of really interesting questions. So one, uh, the trait, the trait you're talking about is flow proneness. And there have been different, I mean, they've looked at flow proneness um, from genetic perspectives. They've looked at it from early childhood experience. They, they've looked at it from the what personality types tend to be, you know, big five tend to be the most flow prone and that sort of thing. And I am actually a little suspicious of the flow proneness argument. And here's why. We humans are built on, like all mammals, six foundational primary emotional processes, right? Jock Poncept, a neuroscientist at the University of Washington, uh, did this work in the 90s. It's, you know, wrote a phenomenal book called Affective Neuroscience. It's sort of the foundation of this thinking. But those, you know, and they're, they're really basic, but there's a panic system, there's a fear system, there's a rage system, there's a seeking system that the curiosity we've been talking about and so forth. And where they, how active these systems are, and each one are tied to different independent brain structures and neurochemicals. There's some overlap, but it's usually independent. Where the levels get set on each of these primary emotional processes, um, is going to determine at least a large portion of which flow triggers you're most susceptible to, right? So there is a chunk of that that is sort of genetic. Now, early childhood experience is gonna impact that and change it. And then ultimately you'll, you'll have your personality on top of that. None of these things are death sentences, right? All of these things can be changed. Even personality traits, which we you know used to believe were, were, were written in stone. And we now know you can change all of them. And in fact, peak performance aging requires a lot of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. uh, working with openness experience to experience and conscientiousness and a couple of personality traits that you absolutely want to cultivate if you want to thrive in the second half of your life. Um, so some of it is that way, but usually it's just, a, and, but the the thing about triggers and the reason like I, I know it's not a death sentence is because the triggers that most people are susceptible to tend to change over time, right? What worked for you in your 20s is going to be a little different in your 30s, it's going to be a little different in your 40s, 50s, 60s, and so forth. Um, so uh, they change as we change. And um, yes, certain people are more flow prone than others. But I want to point out that I think one of the reasons I'm particularly good at this research is I'm not particularly flow prone. And it takes a tremendous amount to get me into flow, which is why I had to get really, really, really good at figuring out how it worked. Um, and I have an incredibly high flow lifestyle, right? I get into flow all the time, but it, it, it was, it was learned. Oh, so that's fascinating and very hopeful for anyone listening. It's like, oh, I don't know if I've ever experienced it. Surely you have, but <laughs> clearly you can also. So this is a great way to transition into your new book. Um, and your uh, publicist gave me a copy. So I've been in that deep. NAR County is coming out. Country. When, oh, the country. NAR Country. And when is it coming Sorry. out? It's coming out February 28th. Fantastic. So we'll be sure and include links for pre-sales and everything. Thank you. So, uh, I am an avid skier. I started skiing at four years old. So I loved your story. I am, I consider myself an expert, but not, not at your level. <laughs> I have not done any freestyle, but almost everything else. So I love this. Dis I want to go into the discussion on skiing and you mentioned skiing at a young age. First of all, how did you start? And then let's talk about the book and, and where you've been lately. But when, when was your first skiing experience? Uh, so we had this discussion recently in my house. I was either seven or eight and, uh -huh. and you know, skiing swept America in the seventies. Yes. Yeah. Right. Hundreds of ski resorts got opened and in Ohio, where I was growing up and all over the Midwest, but Ohio, Michigan, uh, Pennsylvania, they built they literally took garbage dumps, yeah. 
piled yeah. dirt on top of the garbage. And that was right. We learned to ski on converted yep. garbage dumps, right? I did that too. Was, I was in Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, same thing. Yeah, same thing. Right. So that's all over the Midwest. Uh, uh, yeah, I learned to ski on converted garbage dumps. And when I, when I started my career um, as a journalist, right, uh, I always say that, like, you know, journalism is crazy. Uh, field because they let you they pay you to be curious right. which is the weirdest thing in the world right and i was super curious about neuroscience uh -huh. and i was also super curious about action sports so i you know got to spend 10 years or so chasing professional athletes around mountains across oceans and a lot of them were skiers because i was a skier i was living in squaw valley at the point that it was sort of like the birth of what was mm -hmm. back then extreme skiing yeah. right and is now big mountain skiing and, and and whatnot um so i've done it my whole life you know and uh then sort of <laughs> i think lost my mind a little bit when it came to our country but in a good way I, I agree. I was like, wow, this is, it's actually motivating because as I've gotten busier and older, I don't, and now the 70 tell my ski resorts, I'm in Boulder. So I have a lot of access to skiing, but it's the, the traffic is so difficult that you really have to make sure you're a weekend versus a day or two. Like I used to go every Friday when I came out here, I set my clinic schedule to Monday through Thursday. So Friday was ski day. And now I get too busy. So that doesn't happen like it used to, but um, totally, totally love skiing. So um, first question is, uh, what was the, what was the factor that was like the, the switch for this book and this idea? Because you, did you have the idea before COVID? Cause I read yeah, it. Yeah. So COVID. no, I'm what I had been peak performance aging mm -hmm. is about 11 different fields, okay. right. Come together into, in, into one field and they're, and they're all over the place from like embodied cognition and flow science and adult development to, you know, longevity technology and regenerative medicine, a whole bunch of stuff. So I have a long history with all the subjects that feed into it. And I've been researching, you know, some of it was the dog work. Some of it was just as an athlete, you know, breaking myself and having to fix myself some, you know, but for 20 years, but what happened is, so I worked because I'm a psychopath nine years without a break, literally like I would ski, but I would work get up at three o'clock in the morning and work till like 8 a.m. and then go to ski. I saw some of your hours and I'm like, that's insane. Yeah, nine hours are yeah. nice. But like, so I, I literally had nine years without a break and we were moving. We moved from New Mexico to uh, Nevada and I was just burned out beyond belief. And I was, and my break was going to be April of 20, I was publishing a new book with Peter Diamandis. It was launching in February. I knew I was going to be doing book stuff in March. And then April and May, I was just going to ski. I was going to take two months off and I was going to ski. It was going to be my first break in nine years. And COVID happened. And they shut the ski resorts down. And um and I got COVID actually. All those things happened right at like yeah. right at once. And uh I sort of lost my mind. Like I, we were in the middle of a pandemic. I was trying to save my company. I was like, I was doing this, all the stuff that everybody was doing at the start of the pandemic. Um, and yet they had shut the ski resorts down. And I was like, I was so angry and I was <laughs> so angry. And I, I mean, I like, and I, and it wasn't going away was the thing. Like I get angry. Yeah. Sure. But I've got a really, like, I've got a flash temper. I get really hot and then it goes away a minute later and it's gone. And I'm really good at that. And it wasn't going away. And I was like, day after day, I was waking up and I was madder and I was madder. And there was snow in the mountain. And I couldn't even like go hike yeah. at that point because I was so sick with was you know, COVID. And, um, but was just really, really, really frustrated. And I was hiking my dog through the back country and um, sort of talking to myself in my head like what what is this about like where is it like you got to put this anger down like there's stuff going on that's really serious and you need to be right how do I get rid of it and I was like well I was like well why are you so mad and I was like well what was stolen from me I realized that progress had been stolen like I'm getting older this is the thing I love most I haven't accomplished all I wanted to accomplish on skis at all not close and they just took like three months of my ski season away from me. And two of them were going to be spent. Like I, I was mad and I was like, okay, so at least now you know why you're bad. What makes this okay? And I, and I sort of realized that if I could find a way to progress as a skier in the middle of a pandemic with the ski resort shut down with no snow, because it was, but yeah. it was summer, um, 
that would make it okay. Like if I somehow found a way to enter next ski season, a better skier than I had ended the last ski season, that would be okay. Um, okay. So how the hell do you become a better skier? I'm hiking my dog through, uh, through the back country and I came across an abandoned gold mine and there were these enormous tailing piles everywhere. And I realized I'm looking at the tailing piles and I'm like, they're steep. And like that, you can't ski down them. They're not big enough to like make real turns of 50 feet, 60 feet. But I was like, you could certainly shape them into like a hill that like get to a jump, but I've fallen on dirt a lot and broken things. So that's a bad idea. I was like, what about a rail? Never slid a rail in my life or a box. Never even thought about it. I was never a free skier. I was never a park skier. It wasn't, it didn't even interest me, right? I didn't know how to do any tricks. I was a big mountain skier, but I was like, well, hell, rail sliding is, you know, and so that one thing led to another. We built a rail set up in a band gold mine. It's a nightmare trying to learn how to slide rails on dirt. You would I can't imagine when I read that, I was like, you're crazy. It was, yeah, it was, that was, that was actually one of the crazier things we actually did the whole book, uh, but didn't know any better. And then uh, uh, one thing led to another and I was like, okay, I'm gonna, there are, by the way, 10 or 12 different biological factors that say there is no re- way anybody over the age of 35 to be able to learn how to park ski, right? It's really, there's a lot going against you in this particular sport. It's like gymnastics or ballet, the window shuts early in people's mind. But all this stuff I had been reading and studying, right? Said, no, 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 this is wrong. And I was like, well, let's see if theory works. If theory works in practice, exactly. I should be able to teach myself how to park ski at age 53 using these things. And I, I so I made a list of 40 tricks, 20 tricks I wanted to learn. And it was really a list of like zero to intermediate. Yep. And there's a reason for all this. Like I can, I, we can talk about the backstory. of this. So there's a final conversation with me. I just sent me high with Mike that triggers the whole thing that it's not in the book that I'll tell you in a second. Um, but trigger, trigger, triggers this out. But I, I, you know, and I was like, you know, fuck, if it takes me five years to learn all this stuff, great. I'll be into my sixties and I'll be a, I'll be a better skier. Cool. And we took all these ideas, we blended them together and, I went zero, like no skills whatsoever to intermediate in a single season. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. That would, right. And my ski partner, who was a, a former pro athlete, but had gotten hurt and hadn't been yeah. a pro athlete in a lot of years, he started applying the same stuff I was using. And he's younger, yeah. but he started making crazy progress. So that's the story told in our country. What's not in our country that I should finish the story with now with you is uh, that's a pilot study. It's a cool pilot study, two subjects, but it's a pilot study. Right. So this past winter, we took 17 older adults, uh, ages 30 to 68, with the exact same protocol, the same formula, and we brought them into the mountains for four days, gave them four days on the hill. None of them had park skiing experience. Some of them, like I came as, at least as an expert skier, we had like low level intermediates in this group all the way up to, and everybody in the group got a mate, like the experiment was a runaway success and they learned to park ski and their whole, you know, attitudes towards aging the second half of their life, all of it, all of it was fixed. And, you know, my whole goal, this was the chick sent me high story. The last conversation I ever had with Mike, he basically told me, and we were talking like one action sport to add lead to another. He said, look, um, the, the story's long, but the short version, I'm paraphrasing what Mike told me. He said, look, as you get older, have a backup plan. Like whatever it is that gives you the most flow, if your body's going to fall apart and you're an athlete, have a backup plan. And with skiing, the only way I could get into flow was big mountain ski really gnarly lines or ski really, really fast or do stuff that's really dangerous. Right. And I was like, well, that's not going to work as I get older. And Mm -hmm. I was like, if I learn to park, if I can get to intermediate, intermediate is when you stop falling down and hurting yourself and you can sort of control your progress. I was like, I will have a million more entrances into flow because I can use, it doesn't matter what slope I'm on. I could just be creatively interpret. And you don't even need a ton of snow because the parks always have. (laughs) No, I, I was laughing. So we were at North Star two days ago three days ago it was me and my, my ski partner and they had two lifts open one was the one lift that was going half up the mountain and the, the lines were like right it was crazy and the other was the beginner lift that nobody was on but the beginners 
and us because we could turn the side hits yes. into a terrain park really? and something I was like we did 25 laps in a day that like most people got four and I'm like, wait this for the powder days you wait for the back bulls and you have to wait till you know January till that's happened so I totally yeah and it, it, it's all <laughs> yeah. you, you know it, so yeah. I have a million more entrances in the flow yeah. doing my favorite activity in the world but the really like the the wild stuff was what came out of the, the peak yeah. performance aging research and it's <laughs> sort of the methodology that, that we use, so which what isn't are some just, of the core. So take, say someone's listening, like, what do I do? I'm aging. I'm uh, so we did. So we, there's really, there's two halves to it in a sense. Part one is you want to try to turn your life into a high flow blue zone, right? We know what the blue zones are. This is just sort of standard health, well-being, longevity. I'm not a you. I don't know how I wear. I come out on the resveratrol, drink wine research, but so right. ignore that. But the other eight things that 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 make up, you know, the those requirements um, are pretty straightforward. Uh, and then the, what we did is we took a deliberate, dynamic, play-based approach to learning. Yes. So dynamic meaning you're using your whole body embodied cognition you know tells us that the, the more we're using our whole body the faster we're going to learn anyways right um so there's a whole bunch of stuff that comes out of embodied cognition uh deliberate play you've heard of deliberate practice yes. so deliberate practice is anders erickson's fabulous idea about the path to mastery and um his stuff works very well but uh it doesn't have to produce a lot of flow. Deliberate play. So deliberate practice is repetition with tiny micro changes, right? You build on what you did before over and over again. Uh, deliberate play is often described as repetition without repetition or repetition with improvisation. So you do exactly what you did last time, but you improvise a little bit on top of it, right? Deliberate play is way flowier than deliberate practice. And because flow massively amplifies learning, you tend to go farther faster. Dynamic deliberate play um, is even more so. Like in body cognition, it says, look, if we couple movement with uh, thinking or talking or whatever, you enhance, right? You want to learn a foreign language. If you move when you say the words, just move your hand around, you will learn it faster, right? Like that's just standard in body cognition stuff. But there's all kinds of stuff about Vestib activating the vestibular system, so balance or all the dynamic movements really amplify, take that up a notch. And play is so foundational, um, especially as we get older. If you look at like, what do you need? So, and, and when it, the research is really, really clear, if you want to thrive in your later years, you want to have challenging social creative activities. That's what a dynamic, deliberate, play-based approach to, to, to whatever is exactly. Um, uh, so we found a way to put it all together. Um, there's a ton more I, I, I can talk about. Flow plays a major role in adult development as well. So I don't know if you know this, but uh, Chick sent me how I worked on adult development for almost half his career. And he argued, which has been a longstanding argument in the field of adult development, that flow is actually the engine of adult development. It's going through flow states because we become more complex people on the back end of them. We learn, we grow, become more complex. His argument was that was actually the engine of adult development and pushing us forward. So there's a lot of stuff there that's just baked into the flow that that that, that makes it, you know, even a tighter fit. And you have this perfect formula because you're you're like you said, you group, you're social, you're one thought as you're talking is um obviously, and I think you mentioned this in the book, we have trauma, we have experiences, we have accidents, we we shatter our knee skiing. What do you do with those blocks mentally for ah, experience? Yeah, so that's a really so this is a really interesting question. We developed a methodology. So what's at the core of my methodology? One inch at a time. One inch. This is the this was the most important Got thing it. that we did is um so allostatic overload, right, is the technical term for that buildup of all that, of all the trauma and the crap shit that happens over time. Allostatic overload has a huge impact on the challenge skills balance, which is flow's most important trigger, right? Yes. Flow follows focus, only shows up when all of our attention is the right here, right now. So that's what the triggers do. They drive our attention into the present moment. The most famous, the challenge skills balance says, hey, we pay the most attention to the task at hand when the challenge of the task slightly exceeds our skill set. We want to stretch but not snap. 
bunch of years ago, Chick sent me a high on a Google map petition, sat down, tried to figure out what's the actual difference between challenge yeah. and skills. And can we put a number on it? Did the back of the envelope calculation that was not real. And they came up with 4%. And we took their fake number into the, the in, 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 in studied it for a while. Um, and discovered that it was a lot less fake than they thought, that it was a, a really good approximation of the difference for most people, right? It goes up and down, whatever. But what we discovered in older adults is instead of being a 4% difference between challenge and skills, um, usually it's about a 1% difference because there's stuff that has built up. And so I'll give you a great example. As an athlete, I'm sure you're familiar with this, you, where this shows up. So, you know, if you injure yourself, say skiing, right? You break something, leg, finger, hand, whatever, bad enough that like you have to take time out. You may heal from the injury within a month or two, but psychologically, it's going to take about a year or two, a year and a half to you could, your brain will let you ski at top speed again. There's an unconscious governor that will right, regulate behavior. And I, you know, I've been hurt a lot different times and it's, I'm always been fascinated with it because I'm like, I know I'm not skiing. It feels like I'm skiing at top speed, but I can't keep up with people who I normally can keep up with. And no, it was okay, physical, so. right? It's not like you're physically. It's unable. not physical. <laughs> right? My, I'm, I'm like, I'm in the gym. I'm lifting right, as right. much as before the injury. I can do all the physical stuff. It's completely psychological and there's nothing you can do about it until like about a year, year and a half in. And then it tends to fade away. But it's, and I was like, well, that is going to, that same governor is, you know, that's an allostatic yes. overload thing in a crisis situation, but it's going to impact it. So I was like, I think that one of the problems that most older adults have with uh, dynamic physical activities is they remember what it was like to be younger yeah. and they try to push themselves at like four or 5% when instead they need to go like, it is literally one inch at a time. And, and my rule was, I want to do start with an automat, a movement I can execute 100% of the time with zero fear, no conscious interference, and then advance it one micro bit at a time, practice that, you know, in using a dynamic, deliberate play, kind of pra imp improv around it, but very, very slowly until that new bit of movement is hardwired code and then repeat. And that was, that was sort of the core of it. And it's, you know, there's some good uh, motor learning stuff in there. There's a whole bunch of stuff baked in there, but it was the and real And you're really secret. describing neuroplasticity, right? Because you're retraining those lines that we got stuck in. And and, 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 the way of saying and it. just going really slowly. Yeah. And it, it just required way more patience. And the hardest thing for me um, is I, there's a line in the book. And I was actually just talking to a friend of mine about this yesterday. There's a, the line was one inch at a time is no longer fast enough for my ego, yeah. which is true, right? Like <laughs> progress is really right. addictive. And right. like, you know, in the beginning, you're just like, oh my God, I just landed backwards or, oh my God, I figured out how to ski backwards or, oh, like it's such a freaking miracle in, in your mind that you can do any of it. But pretty soon I was like, okay, I can do some, I want to get good. And that was, you know, holding myself back yeah. sometimes. So I didn't put right. myself in the hospital. So I didn't do something stupid. <laughs> and you're rerouting the neuroplasticity. Wow, that's fascinating. That is such a great takeaway. I've got two more questions. Um, first thing is just this random I remember in Jackson Hole when I first got off the big gondola and went down and there's this shoot and like, I remember that that one time when I was just like, I don't know if I can freaking do this, right? And I did and it was great. But do you remember any time skiing in all of your years where you clearly are an expert, above expert level, you've learned a brand new skill with freestyle, but do you remember any specific times where you're looking down a chute or a cliff or something where you're just like, you have the fear, you did it anyway, but that you remember being like scared out of your gourd? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The first time I went to Chamonix, mm -hmm. professional athletes, I was 23 years old. I was with the, the, the so it, the extreme ski movement with the earliest two people in the world, there was two sets of twin brothers or two sets of brothers, the Egan's and the Deloriers, uh, John and Dan Egan and, and Eric and Rob Delorier. And we went to Chamonix and there were a couple other people there. And I am a pretty staunch agnostic. And I spent the every night, I didn't sleep. I prayed all night long. Please, God, <laughs> let me live through tomorrow. Please, God, let me live through tomorrow. Please, God, I don't quite believe in you or know who exists, but let me live. I mean, like literally didn't sleep for a week. Prayed. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, like we tell everybody, I was. I helped start a magazine called, I helped start 
Friends of mine started a magazine called Freeze, which was one of the early extreme ski magazines. I was uh, one of their, I was their Squaw Valley correspondent, what's now Palisades Tahoe. Um, but every journalist who was on staff at Freeze, we all got PTSD. <laughs> story, literally all PTSD, like nightmares, flashbacks. Right, not, right. not, I'm not joking. I'm not being facetious. We got yeah. PTSD our first year on the job. Yeah, I like I I I cannot tell you how many times I had to do things that yeah. I was mortally terrified right. of, and you know, didn't think I was going to live. Um, over well, thanks and for over letting us feel normal because again. I think people. What what is your obviously the the what's the tip in the midst of like, you look down, like, I remember that moment and thinking, I might die, but I'm going to do this. But like, what, what, where do you so, get the edge and what does that do? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff, but I want to point out that when you are a freelance journalist and poor, yeah, <laughs> saying no, like not getting the store, like you have to say yeah. yes. So like that's the, the I need to eat uh -huh. and I want a career. Right. And there's a, there's a hundred people who are going to say yes. If so, if I say no, somebody's got my job, right? Like so, um, that's a lot of motivation. But the, the one of the cardinal rules, um, and this this is in life. This is not just action sports, right. but you go where you look. And so one of the things that's really hard for people when they get into scary shit is they look at the scary stuff, right? You can't look at the scary yeah, stuff because you your body is just like in skiing or all action sports, right. you're moving faster, right? Mm -hmm. Than the conscious mind can process information. So how, like we don't steer the muscles with the mind, we steer the muscles with the eyes. We go where we look, that's how, that's how we do this. So people get into gnarly situations, they're skiing through the trees, they're staring at the trees, they hit a tree. Like, so that's, that's, so that's you know, good, that's first and foremost. Good. There's okay. a bunch of stuff that you can do in the moment, you know, and this is really Andrew Huberman's work at Stanford to regulate fear, but peripheral vision. That's an experiment I run in the book, right? Uh -huh. So if you look out the corners of your eye or really far out, that automatically your brain goes, oh, you're checking shit out. Oh, of the and that's a way the limbic system can be regulated. Yeah, and it totally, it totally, it's parasympathetic activation. There's also uh, the physiological size. So you, right, you inhale all the air you possibly can and then you sniff air on top of it. So that, yeah. that automatically triggers parasympathetic activation, um, calms down. So there are, there's some breath work. There's, there's some physiological interventions that you can use in the moment. And um, now I will also say, and this is another rule that I had in the book, I, then this is the hardest thing about, anything I had to do, I think in the book, which is when I was feeling too much fear, I backed off. That was one I did not push through in our country, right? Um, I, there was, I did a ton of really, really scary stuff, but I, everything was within like I, within range. I actually like, I, if I felt too much fear because it interferes with performance yes. and earlier, younger Steven yes. who had a less healthy ego or more of a need to prove himself, you know, I've broken 87 bones. I don't want to have any more surgery ever, ever, ever. Um, so I would break bones because I would go for it. Now, I it's, it's not that I won't go for it. It's right. that there's a line. And if fear is interfering with my performance or my perception, back off, come back later. I'm not going to, I'm not going to win that one. So that was really, you know, important. But the, the thing about fear and this is the most important thing about, about it, in my opinion. Um, and I've done a lot of writing on fear. I wrote about it in our possible, but like the, there was in, in our country, um, I, uh, I always say, I always tell people, I talk, write about this in the end of the book. I work for the boss. The boss is the version of myself that like makes to-do lists and sets up the rules and that stuff. In the moment, I'm the same as everybody else. I want the cheap, high, the easy out. If I'm scared, I want to run away. But if I've set goals, you know what I mean? That's the boss version. And the boss is my long-term best interest at heart. So I, what I know is also with me and fear is most of the time, if there's something I want to do and I chicken out, the question I have to ask myself is, am I chicken out because I'm scared? In which case I should do it immediately. Or am I checking out because I don't have the skills? In which case I should back the fuck off and come back later. 
And the reason to do it immediately is if I don't, I am literally going to beat myself up and regret it every day until I eventually do it. Like it's not going to stop, right? So when I choose to do it in the moment, I'm saying, okay, I would rather feel intense fear for the next 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, whatever it is, then beat myself up and have to deal with the voice in my head for the next year, two years, like however long it takes me to get back here and, and do this thing. And I know by walking away, something that is probably easy and within my skill set, it's going to get gigantic in my mind. Right. And now I've got more fear, which is going to impact performance. And it's a, you know, it's a downward spiral. So I really, um, I sort of, I set rules in the beginning of my quest for like, this is when I'm going to take risks. And I followed the rules. I worked for the boss. The boss created the rules and they were designed, you know, they were designed to keep me safe in dangerous situations, but they were also designed to push me through it. So I wouldn't, I just learned that those bond, those regrets that I have to live with, this may not be for everybody. But for me, it's so much worse than like short-term fear. I will much rather take short-term fear, which is unfucking pleasant, yes. um, the, than like beating myself up for years, which I will absolutely do. Oh, I love that because there is a place of override. And I've seen that with patients, like teaching them to not always override because there is a place for fear to protect us when the skills, you know, sure. are. No, I it's, love it's, that. I mean, it's a Meditation. wonderful, healthy yeah. emotion, but- it lies to us a lot and Correct. you got to know when is it telling the truth and when is it lying? And that was, I said, the hardest thing that I had to do, there's a lot of, you know, interior reception is a lot of, uh, a, a lot in, is deeply involved in embodied cognition. Absolutely. Right? And yes. one yes. of the hard, one of the, one of the reasons I think interior reception is so important in this kind of peak performance aging on, t on top of the fact that it amplifies learning and, and a whole bunch of other stuff. You want to talk about pattern recognition, yes. right? Those of us with better interior reception have better yes. pattern recognition skills. Um, that's been well established in the science, but the line between fear and too much fear yeah. is the most complicated out of every internal signal I write. And they know, so they know this in intuition. There's a, there's, so they, if you go deep in the intuition literature, and this is where people screw things up a lot. So it turns out intuition at an, before we have words, before we have language around us, not insight, insight is once we get language, but intuition is the, the sense, the feeling. It turns out it's actually not subject to cognitive bias or it's less subject to cognitive bias. So we tend to get a clearer signal. The problem is when the intuition you're getting has to deal with something that's instinctive. So, oh, that, that right. woman at the bar, I think she's really hot for me. I've got this into, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Like that's instinct, yeah. right? Yeah. Sex, hunger, yeah. like those basic things. Yeah. When instinct is involved, don't trust the intuitive signal. There's, there's yeah. really good evidence for this. Um, and on a certain level, dopamine, which is one right. of the things that, right, you can get that will mask an in intuitive signal and things like that. Um, so, but trying to figure out where the hell is the line between fear and too much fear is still, I think, the most complicated interoceptive task that peak performers have to solve. That will be another book. For you. <laughs> I can see that. Um, last thing, I know I want to get you going, but the dogs, I love animals and love dogs. And I love that about you. And what it says to me is you're a badass, you're a brilliant writer, you're award-winning. You, I admire you in all those ways, but the thing I admire most is what you're doing for those animals. Because I start every day by stepping in dog shit. I mean, not eventually, <laughs> but it happens. How did that, has that always been a, a dear to your heart or like, well, obviously I this love. Uh, you want the long story, the medium story, the short story. If you have time, I have time, but I'm honoring. I want okay. to I'm happy to give you the slightly longer story. So I have always sort of believed that a big chunk of your life or a chunk of your life should be service. And some of this, by the way, like it sounds all altruistic and nice and things like that, but it was really like, I grew, I knew very early on that that uh, I didn't really want to be poor and I wanted to be a writer. And the only way you get to be not poor and a writer is you have to get well known. And I came up out of a very weird sort of punk rock community where a lot of people became rock stars and got really famous. It was very it was 2000 people out of Ohio, but a lot of major bands came out of there and a lot of filmmakers and artists and, and, and whatnot. And as you know, 
especially when it happens when you're younger, not fame does not always the best thing for, for people, right? Turned a lot of my dear friends into assholes and I watched it happen. And I was like, whoa, I don't want that to happen to me. But I like, this is the only way I know how to get paid. So I'm going to guard against it by like altruism and service. I'm going to build that into my life. So it's not like that was sort of the thinking. And I was uh, at the time, my, I, I had built a, com a, a, a nonprofit called the Reporters Gym. It was with uh, the LA Lakers and, and Dave Eggers organization, 826 LA. We were teaching inner city kids how to be sports writers as a way out of the ghetto. And it was fantastic. And it was a really great program. But it was, it had two problems. One, I was living with, uh, uh, with the woman who became my wife at the time and we were living all the way across Los Angeles. Um, so I would have to drive all the way across Los Angeles to get to the Staples Center where we were having these things. And it was like three hours to yeah. get there, right? And, and like, I'm giving my time away anyways. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is really painful. But the other thing is, I don't like children. Like, I've never really liked children. I don't have any. I don't want any. I don't like your children. I'm not childproof. My friends who my friends who have children, no, don't bring them around me. Um, and I, and I, here I am trying to, like, teach teenagers how, like, and I was like, this is not a good fit. And at the same time, I was, I just sort of gotten together with Joy, and she was doing dog rescue. And I'm a lifelong animal geek. I mean, and I started, I, I would go really far out of my way to hang out with scientists who were hanging out with animals. So like I would spend two years trying to figure out how to get plane tickets and assignments to go to Madagascar so I could hang out with Patricia Wright, who studied lemurs, because I really wanted to hang out with lemurs, right? And I was like, well, two years are long, right? Like I've gone really far out of my way to hang out with animals. And then I met my wife and she was doing dog rescue and she was living the time with a pack of like nine dogs. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I don't like this altruism thing I'm doing because I don't like the kids and I got it. But like, I can do this thing with dogs, which I, I, I like a lot better. And it's in my house. And I was like, I think I am going to be better at being a little uncomfortable all the time, which is what running a dog sanctuary out of your house is sort yes. of like um, <laughs> versus uh, massively uncomfortable a couple times a week. What right. I didn't actually realize is running a dog sanctuary is actually you're a little uncomfortable all the time and then usually I have one or two crises a week yes <laughs> like something <laughs> terrible happens right? right whatever and so it, it the math wasn't exactly how I thought it was but that was really it I was like okay I'm gonna switch and it was such a good fit because I'm such an animal geek that um you know it it's stuck and I never you know I never I never wanted to stop doing it and I you know it's on a certain level, like it's an excuse that I get to live with a big pack of dogs. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, it's fun. And, you know, when we were running Rancho de Chihuahua, um, which we ran for like 15 years, I had 670 dogs pass through that facility. So you made a done, Did some good. Yeah. yeah. In the world. Love it. Love your story. And I, I just want to honor your time. But where can people find you? I've so enjoyed our talk. And I thank you again because I know your time is precious. My pleasure. So, um, so grateful. StephenCotler.com. Uh, is is me flowresearchcollective.com is uh, the Flow Research Collective and NAR Country. By the way, NAR, which is short for gnarly, is spelled G N A R, right? But NAR Country uh, dot com is uh, is the website for the book too. You can find all that and tell just briefly Flow Research for because I speak to a lot of other doctors professionals who listen to this. If people want to get into this, what they can? Oh yeah, let, let me okay. let me brief yeah. overview on the Flow Research Collective. Perfect. 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 Um, thank you. Um, we're a research and training organization on the research side. Uh, we team up with, with, with folks at USC and UCLA and USC Davis and Imperial College London and a bunch of other places. And we study the neurobiology of peak human performance. So what's going on in the brain and the body when human beings are performing at their absolute best. And we use this information to train people. And we work in 130 countries. So we're, we're global. Um, and we train everybody from professional athletes in like US Special Forces through uh, you know, a lot of major companies, everybody from like Facebook to the Air Force to Bain Capital, Accenture, Audi, yeah. the list goes on, to normal folks, right? Like, you know, soccer dads from Idaho. I've done and, your program. It's phenomenal. You know, <laughs> in, in, in <laughs> we, 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 we train a lot of doctors mm -hmm. um, uh, along the way. Uh, and we, we have done, so we have been working on with two different groups trying to do 
research on flow and surgery because there's a long history of flow and surgery and flow and doctors and you know so we've we've been doing more research there and, and trying to sort of like figure out how to work with medical programs and and, and things like that um as well Super exciting i think docs will love this so i will include all the links if you're listening wherever you're listening um steven kotler thank you sincerely i loved our time together so appreciate you know, my it. pleasure thanks for having me you're welcome